final lesson on our introduction to demand, the law of demand, and the determinants of demand, we're going to outline some of the specific factors that can cause a shift in the demand for a particular good. You'll recall from our earlier lesson that when the demand curve shifts, it is moving either to the right or to the left, causing the quantity demanded by consumers to increase at every price, as in the case of a shift from D1 to D2, or causing the quantities demanded by consumers to decrease at every price, as in the case of a shift from D1 to D3. Let's outline some of the factors that can cause the demand curve for a particular good to actually shift. I like to use an acronym to help remember the different determinants of demand. The acronym goes like this. It starts with a T, then there's an O, then an E, then an I, and then an S and another S. Let's go through each of these letters and learn how it helps us to understand the factors that can cause a shift in the demand for a good. The T stands for tastes of consumers. This is a very simple concept. If a good becomes more popular among consumers, demand increases. And if it becomes less popular, demand decreases. So what can affect the popularity of a good? Let's look at candy, for example. One way that demand for candy can increase because of a change in tastes is if the flavors become better. Actually, there's better quality candy or if there's better marketing or advertising by candy firms that appeals to young people, they would therefore demand more candy at every price. In fact, the main purpose of advertising is to increase demand for products. That shouldn't be a big surprise. Advertising makes products more appealing to consumers and should cause the demand to increase. This, of course, means more sales at every price. Businesses can sell more of their output without having to lower the prices if they can increase the demand through advertising. So the taste of consumers is one of the determinants of demand. The O in our acronym stands for other related goods prices. This could refer to substitutes or complements. I'm going to add a couple bullet points here. A substitute is a good that could be consumed instead of the good in question. So what happens if a substitute's price falls? If a, if a good that you could consume instead of your favorite candy got cheaper, you would consume less of your favorite candy at every price. So if a substitute's price falls, demand decreases for the good in question. If a substitute's price rises, for example, if I like Butterfingers and Mars bars and Mars bars get more expensive, what happens to my demand for Butterfingers? Well, clearly, if the substitute is now more expensive, I'll demand more. So an increase in the price of a substitute would cause a shift from D1 to D2. A decrease in the price of a substitute would cause a shift from D1 to D3. Complementary goods. What are complementary goods? These are goods that are often consumed together with the good in question. Classic examples are hot dogs and hot dog buns, ice cream and ice cream cones, charcoal and charcoal grills, basketballs and basketball shoes, skis and ski poles. These are goods that are almost always used in conjunction with one another. So what happens if a complement's price falls? If hot dogs get cheaper, what will happen to demand for hot dog buns? That seems pretty easy. Demand increases. If the price of one good gets cheaper, I will consume more of the cheaper good, but also more of the goods complement. If a complement gets more expensive, though, what happens to demand for the good in question? Well, if hot dogs get more expensive, you're going to consume fewer hot dogs. Of course, that's the law of demand, but you'll also demand less hot dog buns, even if the price of hot dog buns doesn't change. So demand decreases. It's very important that you understand and are able to give examples of the relationships between the price of related goods and the demand for the good in question. It's not always the same. If substitute prices falls, demand decreases. But if complements prices falls, demand increases and vice versa. And it's also useful for you to have some examples in mind. So keep in mind some of the examples that I gave you today. Hot dogs and hot dog buns, ice cream and ice cream cones, basketballs and basketball shoes, skis and ski boots. These are the types of goods that are always consumed together. The E in our acronym stands for the expectations 
of future prices. This one's pretty straightforward. If consumers expect the price to rise in the future, demand increases today. So this is considered a non-price determinant of demand because we're not talking about what happens when the price of candy changes today. If the price of candy were expected to go up in the future, it would be normal for consumers to demand more of it today. And of course, the idea is you're going to buy it while it's cheap so that you don't have to pay the higher price in the future. And the inverse of this is true as well. If consumers expect the price to fall in the future, demand decreases today. This is because consumers will postpone their consumption of the good until the price is lower in the future. So the expectations of future prices is an important determinant of demand for a good today. Let's move on to the I in our acronym. I stands for incomes of consumers. This one's pretty straightforward. If consumers income rise, demand increases for normal goods. We'll define what a normal good is here in just a minute and decreases for inferior goods. Now, inferior and normal do not refer to the quality of a good necessarily. Rather, they refer to the nature of a good. An inferior good has an inverse relationship between consumers' incomes and demand. What are some examples of goods that consumers might buy less of when their incomes rise and more of when their incomes fall? Sometimes fast food is considered an inferior good. Again, not because of the quality of the food itself, but because there's plenty of evidence that when people's incomes are falling, they'll tend to consume more fast food and fewer restaurant meals. Some other examples of inferior goods are off-brand toiletries. Think about your toothpaste. You could go to the store and buy the most expensive brand name toothpaste on the shelf. You might do that if your income is rising and you feel more confident and you want to consume more of that normal good. On the other hand, if your income is falling, you still need to buy toothpaste. You might not buy the most trendy, expensive brand. You might buy off-brand toothpaste instead. There are plenty of examples of goods that consumers actually buy more of when their incomes fall and less of when their incomes rise. However, not all goods are like this. Of course, there are normal goods. These have a direct relationship between income and demand. The important thing here is that you know that a change in consumers' incomes will affect the demand for most goods, either positively or negatively, depending on whether the good is a normal good or an inferior good. The S in our acronym TOAS stands for the size of the market. In other words, the number of consumers. Recall from the first lesson in this series, that my survey of my own students was of 68 students. As you can see over here, we only had 68 responses, and that gave us a demand for candy that looks like the line you see here. But what if I had surveyed 100 students or 150 students? Or what if I had only surveyed 30 students? Well, it shouldn't be a surprise that an increase in the number of consumers will cause the demand to increase, and a decrease in the number of consumers would cause the demand to decrease. This is quite intuitive and straightforward. So more consumers lead to an increase in demand. Fewer consumers lead to a decrease in demand. So we've got our determinants of demand here. There's one more to mention, although this one is not necessarily a specific determinant of demand. Rather, it is just a basic concept for you to keep in mind. And that is that there might be some special circumstances that affect demand for different goods. A simple example of that could be the weather. In our market for candy here, perhaps when the weather is particularly hot, colder frozen candies might be in greater demand and chocolates might be in less demand because chocolate tends to melt in the heat. Weather could be a special circumstance that affects the demand for different types of goods. Different factors that affect consumer behavior drive the demands for different goods. That's not a surprise. There are all sorts of variables that could cause demand to increase or decrease that are not in one of the categories that you see here. But the categories you see here, tastes and preferences of consumers, the price of other related goods, the expectations of future prices, the incomes of consumers, and the number of consumers or the size of the market are all variables that can cause demand for different goods to increase or decrease. It's important that you are able to distinguish between substitutes and complements when discussing the effect of a change in the price of other goods, knowing that if a substitute's price falls, demand decreases. And if a complement's price falls, demand increases. Have examples in mind as well. The other important distinction is when talking about how a change in income affects demand. 
So we need to be able to distinguish between inferior goods and normal goods. And you must know that when incomes fall, demand for inferior goods rise, and vice versa. If incomes rise, demand for inferior goods falls. If incomes fall, demand for normal goods decreases, and if incomes rise, demand for in normal goods increases. So that wraps up our lesson introducing demand, the law of demand, and the determinants of demand. In the last three lessons, we have derived a demand curve using data from a survey that I gave to my own students. We've examined the relationship between a good's price and the quantity demanded, which is inverse. And we've distinguished between a movement along a demand curve, which results from a change in the price of a good when nothing else changes, that is ceteris paribus, and a shift in the demand curve, which occurs when a non-price determinant of demand changes. The useful acronym for remembering those non-price determinants of demand is T-O-E-I-S-S, -S, or TOIS. Each of these letters stands for one of the non-price determinants of demand that can cause demand for a good to either increase and shift to the right or decrease and shift to the left, as we see here. Here we go.